Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's a real honour to be here and to be doing this talk. Um, well, as you know, I'm a nurse. I was a nurse and in, in the ICU. And that's what really sparked my interest in near-death experiences. It's very common to see death in the ICU and sometimes you could see three or four deaths in just one shift but it was a particular patient a connection I made with a patient who was clearly dying that made me question what happens when we die So, is death really the end of our existence? Is our consciousness just e extinguished, or does it continue in some other form that we don't yet understand? Now, the patient I made a connection with, he was clearly dying, yet we were doing everything that we could to keep this man alive. And he had quite a prolonged suffering death. And I was looking after this man on a night shift. And I just went to adjust the electric bed, and the poor man nearly jumped out of bed in agony. And he, was, he couldn't talk because he was connected to a ventilator via a tracheostomy. But he mouthed to me, leave me alone, let me die, let me die in peace. And our eyes connected, and it's as if I could understand exactly what this man was going through. And I became, became very depressed as a result of this, and it really upset me. And I thought about this all night long. And when I returned home in the morning, I couldn't sleep because he was on my mind. And I phoned work about 11 a.m. And they said that he died about two hours after I, my shift had finished. So that set me on a real journey, really. And that's what really captured my imagination and captured my interest in these ex experiences. So I looked for any nursing courses that were available to help me to, to care for dying patients in the ICU, but there was nothing. It was all geared towards palliative care. So I started reading about death, and then I came across near-death experiences. And I thought, wow, these people are telling us that death is nothing to be afraid of. And I think my scientific training as a nurse had sort of conditioned me into believing that these were some sort of hallucination. So... I was working in, in the ideal place, so I decided I was going to undertake my own study. So one of the questions I wanted to ask was... Sorry. Are near-death experiences merely effects of a dying brain? So the aim of my study, I wanted to find out how common are near-death experiences. Are they the same as, as hallucinations? In the ICU, you get loads of patients who do frequently hallucinate, and these are clearly observable. And also, is the near-death experience due to the drugs that we give the patients? We give them very potent sedative drugs and pain-killing drugs. Do these drugs create the experience? Is it due to lack of oxygen in the blood? Or is it due to high levels of carbon dioxide? So these were the things that I wanted to investigate. But also, I wanted to investigate the out-of-body component. So what I did was I kept random images out of magazines, and I mounted these on very brightly coloured paper that would attract attention. I laminated them, and I placed them on top of the cardiac monitors at each patient's bedside. And these were above head height, and they were concealed behind ridges, so the only way you could view these symbols was if you were out of your body. Now, the next slide is of the ICU where I worked. This isn't a real patient. This is one of my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, the patients are really quite sick. You've got the ventilator doing the breathing for them. You've got the dialysis machine doing the work of the kidneys. And you've got the drug pumps giving support to the heart. I did a five-year prospective study, and it started in 1998, and the supervisors for the research, I was really lucky. I had Dr. Peter Fenwick and also Professor Paul Badham, who were both experts in the field of near-death experiences. I couldn't get any funding from the UK, but I was lucky enough to get my university fees funded by the LifeBridge Foundation in New York. 
So the tools that I used, I used the Grayson Near-Death Experience Scale. This is a 16-point multiple-choice questionnaire with a minimum score of zero and a maximum score of 32. And then if a patient scores above seven, it indicates that a near-death experience has occurred. I also use an in-depth questionnaire and also a follow-up life changes questionnaire based on that used by Professor Kenneth Ring. So the types of illness that we get in the ICU, I worked in a general ICU, so we get all kinds of cases. We get cardiac arrest, we get medical emergencies, we get trauma cases, emergency surgery, and also elective surgery. Now, my patient sample, there were three different samples, which I'll explain to you now. Sample one consisted of the total number of survivors to ITU between January 98 and November 98. Now, not all of these patients came close to death, but I wanted to find out how common these experiences were. But what I found was at the end of that first year, um, because I didn't have any study leave, I had to come in early before my shift started to follow up the patients and stay behind at the end of my shift to go and interview the patients. So at the end of the first year, I was spending longer in the hospital than I was at home, and I was mentally exhausted and physically exhausted. So I revi revised my sample for that reason. So sample two consisted of the survivors of cardiac arrest throughout the whole of the five years' data collection. And then sample three, this was the total number of near-death experiences reported during the five years. I found that when I was concentrating only on the survivors of cardiac arrest, people who had a near-death experience but didn't have a cardiac arrest were also sort of speaking to me as well. So they're in sample three. So I did my research. First of all, I would assess the patient. Were they medically fit? Were they confused or were they too tired for me to interview? Then I would gain a rapport with the patient, and this was really quite easy because I was a nurse. It was easy for me to gain that rapport. And then I simply asked them the questions, do you have any memories of the time that you were unconscious? I then explained the research, and I invited them to participate. And then I gained their written consent, and if this wasn't possible because of injuries to their hands or IVs, I got their verbal consent in the presence of my colleagues. I then asked them to complete the Grayson Near-Death Experience Scale, and then I conducted an in-depth interview which was tape-recorded, and I transcribed this interview as soon as possible. And then I followed up the patients when this was possible, every six months or then annually, to see if there were any changes as a result of their experience. So with my results, in sample one, there were 243 patients, and two of these reported a near-death experience, and two of them reported the out-of-body experience. Now, not all of these people came close to death, so I wasn't expecting a high frequency. But then when you look at sample two, this sample was the survivors of cardiac arrest. It's a much smaller sample. There were only 39 patients, but seven of them reported a near-death experience. So that was quite a, a marked increase in frequency there, from less than 1% to nearly 18%. And then sample three, in the total of the five years, 15 patients reported a near-death experience and eight of them reported an out-of-body experience. So if you look, this is just a frequency of the elements that were reported, and the most common thing that my patients reported to me was meeting deceased relatives. Another common one was entering into another realm, and also the bright light, and also positive feelings of peace and calm and joy, and time distortion. So I'll talk a little bit about the most interesting case reports that I came across in the study. First of all, there was patient 11. This man had a very dense stroke. He was 53 years old at the time of his experience. Now, he had two near-death experiences while he was in the ICU. They were both very similar. 
He reported to me that he found himself, he left his body and he was hovering on the shoulder of the nurse as the nurse was conducting endotracheal suction down his tracheostomy. And he said he was just sitting there watching her doing all this. And then he felt himself being drifted upwards into a warm vortex of air. And he said it was really lovely feeling, it was very comfortable. And then he entered into a beautiful place and he described this as being the beginning of heaven. It had a big cathedral and it was surrounded by lots of trees and there was sparkly glitter like dust in the air. Now he saw his dead granddaughter. She died the year previously and she was playing with other children and she looked very healthy and very happy and he was really happy to see her. So they conversed and had lovely conversations but then she said, you've got to go back. You're the head of the family. You have to go back. And she said, when you go back... Can you tell Mammy this message? So she gave this message for her mother, who was the patient's daughter. Now, when the patient revived, he told his daughter this message, and she was absolutely astounded that he should know this information because it is something that she'd gone to great lengths to keep a secret from him. And this was verified by the patient's wife. So this is really interesting because this man gained information in ways other than through the senses during a time when he was deeply unconscious. There was also the case of patient 12. He was a 23-year-old male, and he suffered major trauma. He was out on his cycle, and he collided. When he came down a hill, he collided with a car, and his injuries were so severe that he was not expected to survive. But he did survive, and I interviewed this patient, and... He said that he could remember seeing his dead grandfather and he was surrounded by a bright light. And then when he saw his grandfather, he knew that he was dead too. He kept also seeing a man who resembled John Lennon and it's as if this man was protecting him. And he, he really felt peace and calm and he wanted to stay there. And he said everything that you would expect to be in heaven was in this place where he found himself. But also he reported hearing a song called Everything is Going to Be All Right. And he kept this being played over and over in his mind all the time. Now, unbeknown to him, when his sister used to visit him, she would go home and in her bedroom she would play that song over and over again. But she never played it at the bedside, or only when she was at home. So he kind of picked up on that in some way. Um, also, this man had a fractured humerus. And because his other injuries were so severe... It was not appropriate to take him to the operating room to repair his fracture. So when he was discharged from the ICU to the orthopaedic ward, it was planned that he would have surgery to repair his arm. But the surgeon ordered a check x-ray prior to going into surgery, and he found that his arm had unusually healed very quickly, and he couldn't explain why this is so. So that really is in keeping with other reports of healings during near-death experiences. Not all near-death experiences are pleasant. Some of them are frightening. Unfortunately, these have been largely ignored, and there's far less about them in the literature than there is the positive ones. Um, they have been tried to be explained away as confusional experiences caused by high levels of carbon dioxide or illusions created by anaesthetics. But my research didn't support either of these suggestions. Patient 14, this lady collapsed at home and had a respiratory arrest, and she described this prototypical near-death experience, but she interpreted it in a very frightening way. On recovery, she described to me, looking down on herself, she said, I can't explain this because I was up there and I was down there, both at the same time. But she also recalled floating towards a, a large expanse of water and she could see a bridge in the distance. Now she's very frightened of water so she didn't want to go towards this bridge at all but she could feel herself moving closer and closer and she was getting more afraid. And then as she got to the bridge she heard these children's voices and they seemed to be mocking her as if they were making fun. And she was really terrified of this. 
But then all of a sudden, those voices just drifted away and she woke up in the ICU, convinced that she had been dead. And patient four, this lady had a cardiac arrest and she had a terrifying hell-like near-death experience. During unconsciousness, she reported that she saw a lady with a straw hat on her head sitting in a rowing boat in the middle of a lake. Now, she didn't recognise this woman, but she, was, she was, knew she was frightened of her and that she had to get away from her. And then she recalled colours and tremendous heat that came from these bright colours. There was a round wheel and it was a light with these colours that gave off terrible heat and smoke. She was petrified and when I approached her on the ward, she, re she began crying. The more she spoke about her near-death experience, the more terrified she appeared to be getting. And in fact, she, got, she started crying so badly, she got to the point of almost hysteria. So I had to terminate the interview because she was getting so distressed. I went to follow her up a few days later, but unfortunately she didn't want to talk about this again because it evoked so much emotion for, for, for her. And she died a few days later. So this clearly highlights that we need to do more research to understand why these experiences occur so that we can better psychologically support these patients. I also came across some very interesting end-of-life experiences or deathbed visions. First of all was um, patient 19. Now, deathbed visions are far less commonly reported in the ICU than they are on a ward or in a hospice, because in the ICU, as patients are dying, they're usually unconscious or they're in a drug-induced coma, so that leaves little scope for the natural dying process. But I was lucky enough to capture two very interesting cases. Patient 19 had been in the ICU for several weeks, well, several months, actually, and it was during this night shift that this patient's condition deteriorated significantly. So we called his family in at 3 a.m. and they sat at the bedside and his condition stabilized. So the family went home. And then about 20 minutes later, one of my colleagues drew my attention to the patient and she said, look at him. And there he was gesturing to someone and he had a beautiful smile on his face and he looked so happy. And he was mouthing the words, what are you doing here? As if he was surprised to see someone that we couldn't see. Now, a few days later, the family were very much aware of my research and they came and approached me. And they said that during the following day when they'd visited their relative, he'd communicated to them that during the night he'd been visited by his dead grandmother, his dead mother, but also he was very surprised to see his sister. And he said, what was she doing there? Now, unbeknown to him, his sister had actually died the week before, but the family had not informed him because they didn't want it to set back his recovery. So that was a really interesting aspect of the case. And he did continue to have these visions for the next few days, and then he died shortly afterwards. And then patient 295 is quite interesting because this man collapsed at home. He was resuscitated and he was transferred to the ICU. He was deeply unconscious and he was not expected to survive. <coughs> a few days later, his family, also having heard about my research, approached me and they told me that when he was admitted to hospital, they were in a big dilemma as to whether or not to go and inform his elderly mother because she too was in hospital, but that hospital was about 40 miles away. Because he was so sick, they decided that they would make this visit. As soon as they approached the bedside of his elderly mother, she said to them, I know why you're here, and I'll make up this name. She said, I know why you're here. It's because of Tony. He's not well, is he? And she said that during the night, she'd had this funny dream where he'd appeared at her bedside, dressed in white, but surrounded by a, a very bright light as well. And he was trying to tell her he wasn't well. And it's as if he, he had come there to say goodbye to her. Now, this coincided with the time that he had his cardiac arrest at home. So that was also interesting. So now I'm going to go on to the strongest case in the study. And this has been published in the winter edition of the Journal of Near-Death Studies in 2006. 
And this is really quite a unique case because I was actually the nurse looking after the patient who had the experience, and I was there while it happened. Only I didn't realise he'd had a near-death experience until about four hours after the event. The man was a 60-year-old male, and he'd been originally admitted to the ICU following emergency surgery. This is interesting because during unconsciousness, he reported an out-of-body experience where he accurately reported the actions of the doctor, the nurse, and the physiotherapist. He also met deceased relatives and a Jesus-like figure. And the most interesting aspect for me is the, con the healing of a congenital abnormality. So I was looking after this man, and um, he was making a good recovery. And although he was still ventilated, the physiotherapist decided it would be a good idea to sit him in the chair because this helps with muscle tone and it's good for your posture, for your breathing. So we sat him in the chair, and as soon as he was there, I noticed his breathing pattern change a little bit. And then the monitor started to alarm to show that his oxygen levels had dropped a little. So I got what we call an ambu bag. I connected it to an oxygen point, connected that to his tracheostomy, and I squeezed extra oxygen into his lungs. His um, oxygen levels came back to normal, but then he started to look really uncomfortable. He started to get grey and clammy, and then his blood pressure dropped, and his heart rate went into a very fast rhythm for a brief few minutes, a few seconds. So I thought, if I didn't get this man back into bed, he would have a cardiac arrest in the chair. So I quickly gathered my colleagues, and we literally flung him back into the bed, by which time he was deeply unconscious. He was not responding to verbal stimuli, and he was not responding to deep, painful stimuli either. So I called the doctor who reviewed him, and we gave him some fluid, which um, addressed his low blood pressure, and that kind of stabilised for a little while. But then his blood pressure started to drop again, and the doctor had had to go off to another emergency. So my colleague kept an eye on my patient while I went to find another doctor, and luckily the consultant was walking into the unit that day. So I said, quickly, can you come and review my patient? So he did, took off his jacket, came to my patient, and examined him. And he said, have you checked his eyes? At that point, I hadn't, so he got a pupil torch, and he very quickly checked his pupils to make sure they were reacting, and they were. And then we treated his blood pressure again, gave him some more fluid, and his condition stabilised. And after about half an hour, this man started to move his limbs, all his arms and his legs. His eyelids started to flicker, so I was happy that he was regaining consciousness. And I noticed that he dribbled from the side of his mouth, so I very quickly cleaned up his mouth. I suctioned it up, and then I, I put a pink lollipop into his mouth to freshen it up. During this time as well, the physiotherapist, who was quite concerned about what had happened, she was hiding behind the curtains, and she kept poking her head around like that to check he was OK and looking very nervous. And um, it was about four hours later, and the ward round were approaching this man's bed area, and he regained full consciousness. And he was very excitedly trying to communicate something to us. So the physio got a letter board, and she, he pointed to it, and he spelled out, I died, and I watched it all from above. And the consultant said, oh, well, you better tell Penny about that then. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I interviewed this man, and he reported to me a very accurate out-of-body experience. He reported being above his body, and in fact, he thought he was higher than the ceiling, and it's as if the, the ceiling had disappeared. He was looking down on what we were doing to him, and he very accurately identified the consultant as having examined him, not the previous doctor who he'd been familiar with that morning. He also very accurately reported me cleaning his mouth and the way in which I did it. And he also accurately reported seeing the physiotherapist poking her head around the curtains, looking very nervous. <laughs> and that was true. But he was deeply unconscious at this time, and his eyes were closed, except for the brief time when the, the consultant shone the pupil torch. But then he said he'd, he described what he felt like a, a, being in um, a very pink room, and he floated up to it. And in this room, he met his dead father, who was calling him, he also met 
a man, and he said, I saw this man, I don't know who he was, it could have been Jesus, but it's not what I'd expect Jesus to look like, because his hair was long and scruffy and needed a good comb in. (laughs) (laughs) But this man also had very piercing white eyes, and he said, I was drawn to look at his eyes. And then next to this man was a lady, and he said, I wasn't quite sure who she was, but then he later identified her as being his dead mother-in-law, who he'd never met but recognised from photographs. Now, all of his pain had disappeared. He was really happy where he was. His father was calling him to him, and he wanted to stay there. But this Jesus figure said, no, it's not your time. You have to go back. And as soon as he said that, he felt himself floating backwards into his body, and the image gradually faded before his eyes. And he said as soon as he was back in his body, he was in immediate pain. And it was such pain that he really did wish he had died. Now, the interesting aspect of this case is the the healing of the congenital abnormality. This man was 60 years old at the time of his experience, and he had cerebral palsy. So his right hand had always been in a permanently contracted position like that. Now, when I followed this man up in his own home about six months after the event, he misunderstood one of my questions. Um, What I was asking him, I said to him, was there anything you could do while out of your body that you can't normally do? Because some people report thinking of a place, say, the pyramids of Egypt, and they can find themselves suddenly there. So that's the sort of thing I was getting at. But he misunderstood that question. And he said, oh, yes, look, I can open up my hand like this. And I've got some slides of this, because this shouldn't physiologically be possible. So this is the kind of position his hand was in before his experience. And that's from another view. And that's the ex- his hand now. So if you look, there's a, quite a contrast in before. Now, I asked the doctors about this, and I asked the physios. And they say this shouldn't be possible, because this man would have had shortened tendons for 60 years of his life. So in order to open out his hand fully, he would have required surgery to release the tendons, but no such surgery was conducted. So how do you explain that? So we know this man's out-of-body experience was accurate, but were all of my experiences accurate? In total, in the five years, there were eight people who reported the uh, the out-of-body type experience. So patient TENS was corroborated. I know exactly what happened, and he reported it very accurately. But then I came across patient 55. She was actually in the first year of data collection. And this lady reported um, that she could see an image of her face, and she was looking at this image, and she said there was a red tube in her mouth. And it's as if the image was trying to say to her, move this tube. So I followed up this lady. I went to the nurse who was looking after her. And she'd returned to the ICU following a surgery. And as she was returning from the operating room, this lady actually did have a tube in her mouth. But the tube is not red, it's blue. But then on further investigation, I found out that this lady was also receiving a blood transfusion, which was in her line of vision. So this would seem more of a mind model made up from what she could feel and what she could see from residual sight as she was recovering from the anaesthetic. And then there was patient 16, and this lady had an unexpected hemorrhage in the operating room. And the original planned operation was abandoned for a different kind of operation. So she had a severe hemorrhage, and she reported to me seeing people in theatre gowns and masks all running around in a panic, which is correct. (laughs) And she also saw people, uh, she saw herself, and she described her skin being as white as the paper I was writing on. And this is true, she did lose a lot of blood during surgery. But there was one aspect of the case which couldn't have been correct. She reported seeing a brooch of her guardian angel pinned onto her gown. Now, there are very strict checks undertaken before patients enter into the operating room, and there's no jewellery allowed. So this aspect wouldn't have been possible. So that was quite interesting. Unfortunately, none of the patients viewed the hidden symbols. But then this kind of just raises the the point to me 
that it's the quality of the out-of-body experience as well, because I found very varying qualities of the experience. Some people floated only perhaps two to three foot above their body. Some people floated into locations opposite to where the symbols were situated. But there were two people who did have very good out-of-body experiences where they were looking around the room, but they did not see the hidden symbols, and they said they were so interested with what was going on in their body that they weren't looking for the hidden symbols. And one of the patients said to me, if I'd have known that there were hidden symbols there, I'd have looked at them and I'd have come back and told you what they were. <laughs> so I also had an out-of-body experience control group in the cardiac arrest group. Now, in the 1980s, Dr. Michael Sabom, a cardiologist, he used cardiac patients as his control group, and he asked them to guess what would be done to resuscitate them. And he found many errors and discrepancies in the, the equipment used. But quite correctly, Dr. Susan Blackmore criticised this because she said that not all of these patients had actually been resuscitated. So I wanted to take my research that step further, really. So I asked all of the patients in my out-of-body um, cardiac arrest group if they could reenact their resuscitation. Now, there were 39 patients who survived their cardiac arrest, and two of these people had the out-of-body component. So there were 37 people in this group who did not have an out-of-body experience. So they were perfect for a control group. So could these 37 people reenact their resuscitation? Six of them were not asked for various different reasons. Perhaps their condition had deteriorated or it wasn't appropriate. But what I found interestingly is that 26 of these patients, they didn't have a clue what we'd done. They couldn't even hazard a guess as to how they had been resuscitated. And in fact, some of them didn't even know that they'd had a cardiac arrest. I found three patients made guesses based on popular <laughs> TV dramas. <laughs> <laughs> and two of them made very educated guesses but what I found was that there were errors and misconceptions of what had been done they were all under the impression that they had been DC shocked with the paddles when in fact they hadn't Some, most of them had just had the CPR and drugs but the two who did have the DC shock I asked them if they could show me where the paddles were placed on their body but they showed me correct, incorrect places. So they pointed to the shoulders or the tops of the legs, which was totally incorrect. So there was quite a contrast, really, between the out-of-body experiences that were reported, especially that of patient 10, and that with the, the inaccurate reports of the control group. Now, a lot of my, patient, uh, my colleagues are trying to tell me that these are just hallucinations. And when I interviewed the total sample in the first year, I also came across patients who were clearly um, hallucinating. So I, I've documented 12 cases for the study just so that I can contrast and compare the near-death experience. And what I found was that 11 of these patients had been heavily sedated with propofol, midazolam, and fentanyl or morphine, or a combination of these drugs and one of them was due to severe sleep deprivation. But when I followed up these patients, I, could, I found out that most of their experiences could be attributed to the background noise, to the tactile stimulation, and also to the staff conversation as well. And some, I, they were very random and bizarre, these hallucinations. Um, for example, in fact, I thought one of them may have been a frightening near-death experience. When I interviewed this man, he said, oh, yes, I remember now. He said, I thought that I was in hell and I was being roasted alive on a spit. So I thought, oh, this is a frightening experience. So I went back and I checked with the nurse who was looking after him and I looked in his notes. But when this man had been admitted to the ICU, he'd come to us from the operating room. His temperature was very low, so he'd been wrapped up in a foil blanket and then with an extra heated blanket as well. And also, his wounds were frequently oozing quite a lot. So the nurses had to turn him from side to side quite frequently to change his position. 
So the fact that he was wrapped in these warm blankets as well, he would feel that he was in hell being roasted alive. Other things that I came across was um, one lady felt that she was on a ferry and it was going from Wales over to Ireland and um, all of the patients are on pressure relieving mattresses. So if you lie on them, it does actually feel like you're floating on a boat because you sway from side to side. And at the time that she was recovering from her or waking up from her sedation, she was being looked after by a nurse with a very thick Irish accent. <laughs> and... Um, other things that they reported as well was um, being chased by drug dealers. Some felt that they were in helicopters. Uh, one man thought that he was being taken prison to um, a hospital in California, and they were, he was in prison there for some reason. But the pilot of the helicopter who was taking him there was the consultant of the ICU. So they were all random things here. But I found that there was a stark contrast, really. The, the near-death experience was very different. It had greater clarity of thought, and it followed a pattern. Whereas, and they weren't attributable to the background noises either. So the findings of my research, well, the closer one comes to death, the more likely they are to report the near-death experience. If you compare sample one, who were not all came close to death, with sample two, who were clinically dead, there was a marked frequency. Unfortunately, the out-of-body experience remains unverified because no one correctly identified the symbols. <coughs> However, the out-of-body reports of the emergency situations were generally quite accurate, whereas the control group had major discrepancies. And I also found that the near-death experience was very underreported. There were only two patients who volunteered the information. If I hadn't approached the other patients, they'd never have discussed what happened to them. And I found that some of the NDEs, they lacked narrative quality. When you read about them in the, the literature, very often they're very story-like. But what I found was that they were quite fragmentary and the patients didn't attach much significance to them at the time that I interviewed them. And they didn't appear to be wishful thinking either. Two people had very unpleasant experiences. And then some people saw relatives they didn't expect to see. And others saw uh, relatives who they didn't expect to see either, who they wanted to see. And the near-death experience was very different to hallucinations. As I said, the, the NDE followed this distinct pattern, and uh, the hallucinations were random. But following their near-death experience, the person was absolutely adamant that this was a real experience. And they described it as being realer than real, and uh, unless you'd had the experience for yourself, you couldn't possibly understand it. And then when I followed up the hallucinating patients, when they reflected back on the experience, they could understand that they'd been hallucinating. They could rationalise in their mind, oh yes, I can remember now, it was hallucinations. And what I found is that drugs, if anything, appear to inhibit or distort near-death experiences as well. So this, to me, raises all kinds of issues as well um, with medication as patients approach death. So I think it's, it's really important to be mindful that we don't over-sedate patients. Now, I'm not saying withhold medication or anything like that, but I, I think it's important that we're mindful not to over-sedate patients as well. And I found that the anoxia and hypercarbia theories were not supported by the research. I did take blood samples of the patients as when they were unconscious, but it was very difficult to pinpoint exactly when the blood was taken and if the near-death experience occurred at the time. So really, we could only use this as a guide. But there were two cases when blood was extracted at the time of their experience, and it didn't support the anoxia or hypercarbia um, theories. The near-death experience was not influenced by the demographic data, such as age and gender. And I found that the deepest near-death experiences led to the greatest transformation or no fear of death. The two people who had very deep experiences were absolutely adamant that death is nothing to be afraid of. 
I just want to briefly as well mention about empathic or shared death experiences, and I know Dr Raymond Moody will be talking more in depth about these later. Um, but I've had some very interesting examples of people who've written to me, and one man contacted me because he couldn't understand an experience that he had while his wife was dying. I spoke to both the man and his daughter, and they both gave very interesting accounts of that day. The lady was dying in hospital. They were expecting her death, and her breathing changed. And the man, the man was sitting at her, her right side, the son was at the left side, and his daughter was at the head of his wife. And as her breathing changed, his daughter suddenly said, look, can you see mum? She's on a path. And he said with that, it was as if he'd stepped into his wife's body, and he found himself walking along a, white, a lighted path towards a man who was standing at the back of, of this path. And he said he was a very tall man, and it's as if everything was wonderful. There was total peace and calm. And his wife approached this man. His daughter watched him from a third-person perspective, and he was in his wife's body approaching the man. And then he said this man gave an all-welcoming embrace and a love, loving hug. And he said with that, the vision faded and his wife had died. He found himself back in the hospital room. But he said to me, what should have been the saddest day of my life turned out to be one of great elation. And his daughter also said, as a result of what she experienced, she no longer fears death herself. And they were both quite concerned because they felt that the nurses may have felt them to be insensitive because their wife had just, smiled, had just died. But they, they had these great smiles on their faces, so it was really quite a powerful experience for them. And also, this is quite unusual for a doctor to approach me. And um, she'd heard about my research, and she said, I've had this experience, but I can't explain it. Maybe you can help me out here. She'd been looking after a lady in the community and had been doing many home visits. And as she was approaching death, she did more frequent visits. And um, she got to know the family well. And the husband had showed her a photo of her when she, the lady, as she was a young nine-year-old girl, stood next to her father and a big black dog. And this is what the doctor said to me. On the day the lady died, I was present. As she died, I had an overwhelming feeling that everything was going to be all right. I just knew that her father and the black dog had come to meet her. It was a very strange experience for me, and one that I just can't explain. I have over 18 years' experience of being a doctor, and I have looked after many dying patients. I have never before or since had such an overwhelming feeling with any other patient. It was a nice feeling, and it was as if the lady was safe, and that she was being happily reunited with her father and her childhood pet dog. So clearly... Something very interesting is going on here, and it's no longer acceptable to just dismiss these experiences. They're not just hallucinations, because these people at the bedside, they weren't close to death themselves, they weren't lacking in oxygen, and they were not on drugs. So many people say to me, well, what's the point in doing this research, then, Penny? What are we going to learn from it anyway? We're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I think we can really provide greater psychological support to people who have the near-death experience. It's so important that we acknowledge these experiences and that we are there for these people to talk to us. I've also found them to be very useful in the care of the terminally ill, and they can guide us with spiritual counselling with us at the end of life as well. And um, I've put this into practice, not only in my workplace as a nurse, but also with my grandparents. I had the privilege of looking after them as they were dying, and we had many great conversations about near-death experiences, and I know it did ease their transition into death. And they're also very helpful in bereavement and grief, and many counsellors now recommend that their clients go and read accounts of near-death experiences. But more importantly, these people have really inspired my life as well. And I think, as individuals, we can all reevaluate and have a different perspective on life. And as a result of doing my research, my life has 
has got greater meaning and it, I just feel so en enriched and inspired by all that I've learned and I think it can have benefit for every one of us in this room, everyone on the planet. And how we respond to a near-death experience is also very, very important. The way we respond, it can really severely impact on the way that the experience is integrated into the life of the person. In some instances, it can take years and years and years for people to understand fully what they've experienced. So really, a dismissive attitude is really unhelpful and detrimental to their understanding. And I think it's really important that, irrespective of our personal beliefs, it's really important that we listen and that we provide further information if necessary. There's lots of resources out there on the internet. But most important thing, I think, is that we validate these experiences for the patients. We tell them they're not alone, they're not the only person to have this experience. So my conclusions, well, my conclusions are really quite simple. Basically, our current science as it stands cannot explain near-death experiences. And I think more, the more research that is being done in the clinical area is now showing that near-death experiences can no longer be dismissed or explained away. And I really believe that our science must be revised and expanded. But future prospective research on a large scale is paramount to further the understanding of near-death experiences consciousness, death, and most importantly, life. My friends and family used to call me morbid because I was studying death. <laughs> but I really think it's only when we start to learn about death that we really start to learn about life. And I'm going to finish here with a, a quote from a lady called Christine Stewart. She was 11 years old and she had this near-death experience when she was out playing with her friends. And this is what she had to say. I was like most kids of 11, mucking about on my way home from school that day. I stepped off the pavement without looking into the path of an oncoming car. I was thrown across the road and remember thinking it was going to hurt when I landed. I heard a loud snap and saw a flash, at which moment I began rising out of my body in great, at great speed. I felt no pain as I seemed to lift higher and higher and it became dark and I was still travelling rapidly. There was an overwhelming sense of being loved, like the whole universe loved me. I came to a stop in front of some sort of barrier which looked like a privet hedge. There were flowers growing in the hedge which were huge and much bigger than my head. Beyond the hedge, there were people looking out at me. They all seemed very interested. Then there was the lady. I call her the Shining One. She was so beautiful. I knew immediately that she was hundreds of years old, but had the face of someone perhaps in their thirties. I was happy to be there. The feeling of love and peace was beautiful. You must return, said the lady, although I never once saw her mouth move. I went to object, but this, at that point I found myself in a great deal of pain on the side of the road and the ambulance man and a huge crowd of people looking around me. I learned quickly that my experience was something that I should keep quiet about because people looked at me strangely if I spoke about it. But I won't ever forget it. And as I grew older, I realised that more other pe many more other people other than myself had had a similar experience. The experience has helped me through some of the darkest times in my life. Death is not the end. And she says, My belief is that if everyone had a near-death experience, there would never be another war, no one would ever starve or be the victim of violence, and greed would become a thing of the past. So let's not ignore these experiences anymore. Let's hear what these people have to say and share in their wisdom and insight. I would like to thank all of the patients who are in my study and all of the people who have written to me and emailed me over the years. They have been my greatest teachers. And thank you all for your attention.
was curious that both of you had said that uh, uh, when people near death experiences, they sometimes saw relatives uh, before. Is it only relatives? I've never, never heard anybody mention anybody uh, except relatives or Jesus. Yeah, they can see, um, sometimes they describe a being of light, and sometimes this being of light could be associated with a person's culture. So, for example, people in the West would see images of Christ, whereas in the East, maybe a Hindu deity such as Krishna. Um, also, patient, um, young children who have the experience, sometimes they see pets as well. But no friends or other yeah, people? Fr friends and relatives as well, yeah, they can see. There's a question over here. Uh, both in lecture one and in your lecture, you found that about 18% of post-cardiac arrest had, had NDEs. Uh, since by definition, we all are going to be near death, what is your hypothesis around the 82%? don't know. Why, why is it that, yes, only a certain percentage report the experience? Is it that everyone has an experience, but they just simply can't recall the experience? I've had people write to me over the years, and some people uh, were near death or um, had a cardiac arrest, but they didn't recall anything. But then later on, one lady in particular, she went into um, the operating room, and while under anaesthetic, she recalled an out-of-body experience and a near-death experience that had related to the previous time when she'd been near death. So is it that it's, we all have these experiences, but we just don't recall them? We don't know at the moment. Since, since there's a lot of positive to the near-death experiences you've described it, uh, and the first speaker, um, has it affected your own attitude about wanting? And is it, you know, do you find people say, I want to have one of these experiences, particularly the last quote that you put up there? Uh -huh. and, and what's your response or reaction or thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's totally changed the way I've lived my life now, these experiences, what I've learned from them. Um, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, would you like to have a near-death experience? Well, I don't know if I'd be brave enough to sort of say, yes, I'd like to have a near-death experience itself. But I would like to sort of experience what they experience, but not in the context of near-death. <laughs> <laughs> You spoke of um, the, the healing that took place in one of the patients. I'm wondering if you have more examples of that or if you have any experience where somebody who was bedside um, had a miraculous healing. Um, there are cases out there. There are many on YouTube at the moment. And um, I'm, I've got a blog, and I, I tend to put a few things like that on the blog. So if you look out for the blog in the next few weeks, I'm going to make... Um, some examples of these healing cases. But there's also a really um, popular case at the moment by Anita Morjani. I don't know if anyone is uh, familiar with that case. Um, she's on YouTube, she's got her own website, and she had a near-death experience, and following her near-death experience, she had lymphoma, and after the experience, her lymphoma has disappeared and gone. So that's quite an interesting case. So. Um, I'd look that up. In this uh, era where people contribute so much through the internet and we can learn from everyone else so much more quickly than we could before, uh, for example, when Dr. Moody was start first starting his work, there are many people probably in the audience who have been with someone who has had it or have been practitioners in some way. I have stories of near death. Where would be a collective to put that information so that researchers, when they need it, could also go back and verify other stories to get the most, um, you know, I mean, not just it's here on this blog and it's over here, there, mm -hmm. it's over there, and everybody has to start from new to verify, mm -hmm. et cetera. Is there a collective place where any of us should at least put the work that has been done if we've done it or we know of someone else's work. Yes, I think um, the International Association of Near-Death Studies does a great job and they've got a lot of archives there. So um, people do report their experiences there and they're all logged there. And there's also the NDERF website. 
um, Dr. Jeffrey Long and his wife Jodie Long. They maintain that site, and that has got some amazing cases as well. So uh, I recommend those. Uh, I, the first time I've ever heard of a negative near-death experience. And do you have any idea what that might be about, or a hunch even? Or maybe do the people who had it have a hunch? Um, well, there are a few schools of thought on this, and um, some people have suggested it's due to um, fundamentalist religious views. Maybe they've been brought up in that environment, um, and that could affect it. But um, And there's also then, Carol Zaleski has um, suggested that it's all to do with... Um, the ego and it's the failure to relinquish the ego so very often perhaps the people who have the frightening experiences are people who are usually very much in control of their lives and they haven't got control during this experience and sometimes these experiences do change into very pleasant experiences and it appears at the point at when they relax into the experience rather than trying to hold on to life so it could be to do with that but we, we really don't know my question is about, um, I talked to somebody who did have a near-death experience, but you know, I didn't like ask questions. Um, it was a vision that he saw of an area where he, he recognized. But I just wanted to know what questions would you ask if you found somebody that was, had had a near-death experience that you find most helpful? Um, well, the most helpful thing really is not really so, to say a great deal and to let them do all the talking as much as possible because I, I don't want to put any ideas into their mind and it's, it's a very personal and subjective experience so it's important that they sort of process it themselves uh, rather than me influence it in any way. So I just sort of guided them and just said, what do you remember? And I just listened as much as I could really. And then perhaps at the end, if they'd finished, I could then... Uh, maybe clarify a few of the points that they had mentioned. But I think the most important thing really is to allow them to do all the, the talking. Thank you. I have just a very brief comment to the negative uh, ND experience. Uh, Chris Beige has a wonderful book which is called uh, Dark Night, Early Dawn where he actually has a chapter about this. And his idea is that it's uh, related to a kind of interdimensional tunnel, uh, uh -huh. that when we are born, we sort of uh, go through a uh -huh. tunnel from one world to another. Yeah. And then uh, um, something similar can happen when we are dying, when it happens uh, sort of in the reverse way. Right. Yeah. And there's a possibility of going through the tunnel fast Mm -hmm. into the into the light, mm -hmm. but it's also possible to get stuck in uh, uh, like what I call the second matrix of birth where uh -huh. there's a no exit situation yes. uh, where people in psychedelic sessions would experience hell typically. Uh -huh. right. yes. And I have just a very brief uh, question which I wanted to ask actually uh, before during the discussion. Have you seen uh, that the disembodied consciousness perceives things in uh, farther locations or was it all uh, limited to because uh, to the room where it was happening yes, because yes. in B bardo turtle mm -hmm. when we die we become the bardo body mm -hmm. and according to the tibetan book of the dead the bardo body can travel anywhere mm -hmm. in the world the yes. two exceptions which is the mother's womb mm -hmm. uh, and bodh gaya which i think are references to reincarnation into the womb yeah. or Bodhgaya is the place where uh -huh. uh, the Buddha uh, achieved uh, enlightenment. So if you are in, in mm -hmm. uh, the experience of enlightenment or you are incarnated, you are not in the bardo right, yes. anymore. Uh -huh. Well, I didn't get any cases like that in my actual study, but I have heard of cases. Um, there was one in the hospital where I conducted my research, or the, the other hospital that is the sister hospital. And one of my colleagues reported to me that someone had this um, near-death experience and they left their body. They were downstairs in the emergency room and they travelled about three or four storeys up. And they found themselves in the um, maternity department and they watched a baby being born and being named and then they came back into their body. So when they revived and said about this, apparently the nurse had gone and made some checks several days later and this was corroborated. 
spin it. So that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Excuse, excuse. I, ha I have a different kind of question. Um, I'm very interested in the experience of life review. Um, and I would think that that might be kind of negative for some people, that they were either maybe perpetrators or mm -hmm. um, victims of a lot of violence mm -hmm. um, or a body that was, um, you know, really painful. And um, it seems like that would influence their um, their interpretation or their or their experience of the N that NDE. Yeah. Well, with the, the life review, that's a really interesting aspect of it, really. Um, some people describe that when they look at their life review, sometimes they're accompanied by a presence, and it's a, also, almost as if this presence is there to give them comfort and guide them through it because they look at their lives and they can see things that they did that they're not proud of and they have to relive it and sometimes they relive it from a third person perspective as well and there's a very interesting case in the literature and I think it's the case of Tom Sawyer and he reported how um, he came across a drunk man and he punched this drunk man to the floor but he experienced it as being that drunk man and the man was drunk because he'd recently lost his wife and then he felt the humiliation of landing on the floor in that state and so that really changed Tom Sawyer as a result of experiencing it from that way. So yeah, the, the life review is, is really a very interesting aspect of it, yeah. Have you, um, excuse me, have you ever um, experienced in your studies or is there anything in literature about people who have life death experiences and when they come back um, they're so focused on that experience that they literally would uh, will themselves to death? Um, no, sometimes there's, there's a lot of um, reminiscence about going back to that experience and they do miss it a great deal. Um, there was a case that um, Professor Jan Holden has discussed and this uh, client of hers did have a near-death experience and he longed to go back to it. And um, it's the only case I've heard of where he did actually end his own life. So. Can, you, can you practice to have a near-death experience? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, well, I, and by that I mean if you, say, engage in certain spiritual practices mm -hmm. like meditation or visualization and so on, if you are in that terminal place, are you more likely to have a near-death experience than someone who doesn't do, hasn't done that? Do you see any correlation? Yeah, that? um, that's interesting really because, yeah, I didn't sort of look at that aspect in my, um, the research that I undertook. But yes, yeah, certainly certain practices can influence you and it, it can sort of give you this altered state of consciousness as well. So if you've already, if you're well versed in these spiritual practices as you're dying, it's generally probably going to be easier for that person as well. So yeah, yeah it can influence it. Hi, um, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Presentation. I um, was wondering if you think that the um, the near death experience could be um, could be either not determined or factored by the setting in which the um, the person, you know, either hospital or the you know eleven year old who had the you know, traumatic uh -huh. um, car crash or car, yeah, yes, whether yeah. that sort of if changes um, or makes it. You know, the experience is different. Well, I, when you look at things, when you look at um, altered states of consciousness or people who perhaps um, take drugs and things, you have to take into account then uh, the setting, the context, and people who are with you and things like that. But with the near-death experience, it's very spontaneous and it's very unexpected in most circumstances. So it didn't appear in my research to be influenced by the actual context or the, the set or setting at all. It, it just... They were just spontaneous experiences for them. Yeah. 